we really believe in uh, the power of design and the value of design, but, but doing it in a smart way. And Business of Architecture, episode 398. Hello, Architect Nation. This is Enix Sears. And today you will hear an interview that Ryan Willard did with Arno Mattis, who is the design principal and founder of Arno Mattis Architecture. Arno has over 28 years of experience delivering award-winning architectural projects in Vancouver and beyond Vancouver, Canada. He's a former senior director of Bing Tom Architects, played an active role in the design and management of numerous award-winning landmark projects, including Arena Stage in Washington, D.C. and the Sunset Community Center in Vancouver, Canada. In 2005, Arno founded Arno Mattis Architecture, which is located in Vancouver, Canada. AMA specializes in densifying coastal cities with modern spaces that connect to nature, and their portfolio includes mid to large scale hotel, residential, and office spaces. World Architecture News has counted AMA among the outstanding forward thinking people and organizations who have the demonstrable potential to be the next big thing in the architecture world. Arno holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the University of Oregon, a Master's from Harvard's Graduate School of Design, and an MBA from Queen's University. In today's episode, you'll discover how Arno has taken that business lens to look at the architecture and the business of architecture. You'll discover how the practice has evolved, the challenges that he's dealt with, and how really understanding the language of business has been instrumental in empowering this firm's work to be able to push the envelope on what's possible. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Arno, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Good morning. Great, thanks. Brilliant. How are things there in, uh, in, in Vancouver? Well, we got a little snow last night. Uh, everyone's getting into the Christmas spirit, so uh, things are tense and we're under deadlines as usual. <laughs> but we'll, we'll make Very it. good. You guys have yeah. got a, um, an intense schedule for the next few weeks before the holiday period yeah it just seems like the kind of standard uh, cycle that right before christmas every year we seem to put in our our longest weeks of the year mm -hmm. and this year is no different um so hopefully uh we'll get through it and uh we'll take a break soon great great excellent so you are the design principal and founder of Arno Mattis Architecture, which was founded in 2006. Um, you've got had a really interesting career. Uh, I know that you've, you studied at, um, at Harvard, at University of Oregon, uh, and you also have an MBA from, from Queen's University as well, which, which gives you a real kind of interesting underpinning to your design sensibilities, but all, and you've also got a, a rich knowledge and experience of uh, business as well that integrates into the into the practice. So I, I guess the first question where we can kick off with is you've you've been going now for for twenty five years. Um, how have things changed from two thousand and six to where you're at now? Uh, I mean, since we started, it, it's a much different um, practice uh, than, than what we were back then. Uh, we started in a shipping container uh, office, squatting on a on a industrial site in in Vancouver um, with just a, a couple of people. No heat. Actually, on a day like today, uh, we'd basically be be shivering in the winter and sweating in the summer because we had no HVAC. Uh, to an office of, of 20 today, uh, we do have heat. <laughs> Hopefully it's on. Uh, and, uh, and a much bigger operation with support staff and so on. So it's been, been quite a, a trek in a, in a relatively short period of time. Mm. But uh, uh, it seems like it, it goes by pretty quickly. 
Amazing. Um, and and what was it that had you set up your own practice at the beginning? Uh, I think it was something always on my mind. Um, when I first learned about the profession of architecture, I guess I was in, in the high school years, I just sort of assumed that all architects uh, eventually went out and, and worked on their own. Like it was uh, sort of studying the history of architecture and, and looking at the kind of great names of the past. They all seemed to sort of be able to do all these magical things on their own. And it wasn't really until much later that I realized, oh yeah, this, this is a real team sport and and uh often many many people involved but i i think right from the beginning it was something that i had this idea that maybe i would do this uh and, and be a leader of some some kind of enterprise on my own mm. well, and what was your experience like um when you were working at bing so that was the practice that you were at beforehand being being tom architects and how did that kind of lay the foundation for some of the entrepreneurial ventures that you were about to get yourself into? Sure. I, I first started working with Bing when he had uh, set up his practice. So he, would, he was only about two or three years out and he had left uh, a very well-known uh, practice here in Canada uh, run by Arthur Erickson. Uh, Arthur was a sort of the godfather of Canadian modern architecture. Uh, Bing decided to strike on his own with a few f folks from, from that firm. Mm -hmm. And I joined a few years after that. So it was, it was a fledgling operation. I think there were eight of us when we first started. And uh, over the years that I worked there, uh, it grew to a practice of, I think, close to 60 staff uh, with, projects around the world. Uh, so I saw the, the kind of full spectrum of, a, of a, I guess, a fairly meteoric rise of, of a practice, but uh, it, was, it was really from, from jack of all trades to becoming a, a kind of manager of a fairly large firm by the time I left. Mm. And uh, Bing was, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, but uh, he became also quite a recognized architect in his in his own right. And really, by the time we were, by the time I left, and certainly the last few years, we were competing against some of the biggest names in the industry for for projects, and we we're continually on on short lists. And and I was traveling around quite a bit. Um, working on teams in the u.s and so on mm. so it was uh, quite an experience and and when you set up on your on your own what were some of those initial projects and how did you win them so when we started in 2006 uh i i think those of, of us that remember that time uh it was a pretty fast pace a pretty good and happy days for most most firms. Everyone was busy, certainly in North America. There were pretty heady times. So what was happening a lot was that firms, especially larger firms, were uh, taking on more work, really, than they could manage. And we knew some of the principles around town just, just th through our years at BTA, Bing's office. And uh, we approached some of these folks, including Bing himself, for some help, you know, if they needed some help, they could give us a call and we could help them out on some projects. So a lot of our early work was actually doing concept design work and design development work on fairly large scale projects, towers. Mm -hmm. uh, we even did a project for a, a contact of a colleague of mine in, in Singapore for a project in Dubai which was uh, amazing at the time for <laughs> a small practice of four people. Yeah. We were flying back and forth to Dubai, working on this massive tower project uh, called the Emirates Financial Towers. So it was, it was a pretty amazing time actually to, to start a firm. And, and I guess I sort of thought this is the way it's going to be, you know, we're going <laughs> to just, this is, we're, we're going to start from this and we're just going to keep going. But uh, of course we all, know that in 2008 2009 everything came cr 
crashing to the ground and and it was a whole different story after that mm. well what was the impact on 2008 2009 on 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 your practice did it mean that you had to scale back operations and, and that this is always such a defining moment in so many businesses that i um that i speak to because it was kind of a recession like like never before yeah i mean i i had been through a few ups and downs when I was working at Bing's office. So mm-hmm. I sort of felt like I understood the cycles and, and were, was sort of mentally prepared for it. But I don't think anything could quite prepare us for what happened in, in 2008 because uh, within a, a short period of time, every time the phone rang, it was basically a client uh, telling us to put a project on hold. And it got to the point where we just dreaded the phone because we we just didn't want to get another call but it it was just basically virtually a a full shutdown of all the projects and uh we had to let a few people go and we were down to just a handful of us trying to sort of scratch our heads trying to figure out what what to do next Mm. so i uh you know i started looking for opportunities to generate any kind of income I could, including teaching work and and so on. But there really just wasn't much out there at the time. So uh, we just kind of suffered our way through it for a couple of months. But then uh, we had a a fellow phone us up that that we knew. Uh, He was a contractor, worked for a construction company, and he had a client that wanted to build a custom home. And uh, we sort of put our heads together and said, hey, uh, we could design it. I think his, his initial thought was, why don't you guys do the design for this house? And we were, of course, interested because there wasn't much going around or much to do at the time. Mm. Uh, but then we sort of put our heads together and thought, why don't, why don't we design this and build it? Uh, you know, sort of design build company. And that was the beginning of uh, a little company that we started uh, and ran for a number of years that basically got us through those through those kind of lean years up to 2010 or so. Interesting. So you, you, you kind of started to take the approach of design build kind of relationship. You know, it's something we always thought about. Uh, certainly, you know, having been exposed to the kind of business aspect of, of uh, running a, a firm by the time I left Bing's office, I, I sort of was, I thought I was uh, well versed in the kind of operation uh, financially of a practice mm-hmm. and understood where the margins were at and, and how difficult it can be for many firms. So, yeah. uh, and most firms actually, <laughs> but uh uh, so I always thought, uh, you know, maybe architecture needs to be combined with some other aspect of, of uh, related business and, and construct, construction certainly seemed like one option. Uh, when I was working at Bing's office, he was, uh, and, and not many people know this, but uh, he was also doing a lot of development work and, and uh, land development on his own in his own right and had a, a little operation going that I believe actually he used to help kind of finance some of the some of the things he was doing in the practice so so it was something I always was thinking about and we thought uh, since we're not doing much why don't we uh, just take a, a, a kind of dive into the construction business and and see what that was all about so we we built a very small team at that time, there were some really uh, uh, really talented people that were available because of the recession. So we were able to pick up one or two uh, guys that, that knew how to sort of manage the site operation side of things. Yeah. And my partner and I did the front end and uh, that was it. We just uh, started with one project and then Another one came along, which was the the floating house uh, that, that you see in our website. And those two projects basically kept us rolling with a very small team for a number of years. But it was, uh, 
Not a, I mean, it was an interesting time and we learned a lot about the construction business. Uh, it's, it's also an extremely difficult business uh, running, doing architecture and construction at the same time is uh, intensely challenging. And I think any, any firm that's, that's doing it, I, I really tip my hat to mm. them because it's, uh, it's an intense amount of work juggling both of those. And they're very different in, in many respects. Um, construction is a, is a kind of time based uh, and very resource in, intensive resource management intensive uh, kind of business. Mm. Uh, it's very uh, connected in the sense that uh, if you're not sort of plugged into where the local trades are at and you're getting uh, connected into maybe trade sources that aren't as reputable and so on, your life can be quite difficult. Yeah. Um, so having those relationships established is, is sort of critical to running a construction operation, which in a way we were lucky because we, we did manage to hire a, a couple of guys that had those connections, but even then having not operated for a long period of time or, or at all, um, you know, often the more reputable trades would take on work that, that they knew would be with their um, kind of long established relationships and we'd sort of get the leftover folks coming to our site. So uh, those, those all, those aspects of construction really can present a lot of challenges mm. to, to doing the work. Yeah. So, so how long did you keep up with the construction company and, and how did you let go of it? What was the process that you went through to kind of um, let go of that particular part of the venture? And why did you, why did you decide architecture and not construction? As, the, as if you know, if you were kind of deciding between the two, if you like, um, I, I think uh, you know my passion was always in design and, and, and architecture, so I always kind of leaned in that direction to be, to begin with. But I, I think we had a few experiences uh, in, in construction that sort of convinced me that that maybe architecture was was the better way to go. We had a a call one day from from the local police or the RCMP uh, is such and such a person working on your job site. Da 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 da. This person's wanted for murder, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If he's if he's there working on your job site, perhaps uh, you could maybe just quietly, you know, let him go or whatever, and we'll you know, or tell us it, it, lock, lock the sites up and uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll come and pick him up. We'll come and get him. <laughs> so that was that was a little bit of a you know, we were a little nervous about that situation, but anyway, I think it worked out. Okay. But, uh, I, I think more than that, uh, we just found certainly as an architect, we sort of leaned towards the quality end of the spectrum and, and really wanted to make sure the work we did was, was excellent. And, uh, we ended up putting, uh, a lot of resources into the work, probably more than, than we should have. So we really didn't make anything off the projects that we did. And, and I think at the end of the day, uh, that sort of combined with some of the challenges of, of running construction uh, sort of led to maybe a decision that, that uh, architecture is the way to go. Uh, the other thing that was happening at the time, so we ran it about five or six years. So gradually the, the sort of design practice started to pick up work, work of scale, and it became uh, challenging to sort of juggle both. And, and I yeah. decided at that point that, that uh, uh, we'd let the construction business go and we'd get back to focusing full time on, on design practice. So, so I guess from a, from a business standpoint as well, that the architecture business was performing better or was just easier for you to handle or was it more like a, a preference of actually, you know, we're architects. I, yeah, I was certainly where my heart was at in, in terms of uh, my passion for running uh, that type of business. Uh, I think at the time we were getting a lot of front end work. Uh, so we're doing a lot of design, design development, which was also where, uh, you know, I sort of felt most comfortable and, and the work was uh, generating some income. So mm. 
uh, I think it was uh, just kind of more fun for me, I guess, <laughs> that eventually I ended up sort of just, you know, I mean, I, I think sometimes you just kind of know in your heart that one thing is right and the other thing is not. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's that's where we ended up. And and just since, since that time, uh, things have, have grown and there's uh, some other opportunities have have presented themselves including getting in into development which was i i think is is more aligned with uh the kind of uh mentality of a, of a design practice i mean there's there are different uh kind of thought process but but at the same time uh putting a project together from a development point perspective is, is not too dissimilar to to kind of a thought process that architects engage in yeah yeah and it, I, I guess it, you can be much more self-directed in that context as well yeah and the, the amount of resources that's that's required is is much less um to sort of take on the development work is we, we were all already quite a an office that was leaning towards the front end of projects anyway so it made sense for us to to reach even further into mm. uh, you know sort of land acquisition and and so on so and has that and so is that part of the business model at the moment where there was there was a kind of active development part involved in it where you guys are kind of building and maintaining equity in the in the projects or it's evolving it's starting to become a more active part of the business uh, since 2010 it was always uh, a kind of goal and objective of, of mm -hmm. ours to to sort of move in that direction and i think the opportunities are starting to present and we're we're moving in that direction we're we're about to uh, purchase a piece of property to develop our own office and, and so on. And, and there's some other deals in the works uh, that, we're, that we're looking at as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it, and, and I think uh, maybe naturally that um, many practices probably evolve in that direction over time because the, the kind of comfort level with uh, the, the kind of, that aspect of the work starts mm -hmm. to starts to kind of get there and and uh it seems like there's quite a number of practices uh, at least a lot of the more successful ones uh that i know of that that have uh, ventured into that uh area of, of practice to to kind of help with um the kind of alternate cash flow of yeah <laughs> well, cash stream process what's interesting and obviously you have an MBA um, which you which you accomplished prior to setting up um, your own firm um, with with that kind of business lens looking at the architect looking at an architecture business um, where is it that you think or why is it that margins might be so difficult in architecture and, and 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 why do why do we see this a lot? A lot of practices often looking for different ways of of maintaining cash flow or kind of ironing out the cash flow. I mean, that's a <laughs> where do we begin with that question? <laughs> um, let's see. Um, I I think. Uh, you know, there's a long history to, to how the profession evolved and, and how things are, are set up. Um, there's a framework to, to practice that, that really lends itself to uh, challenging, uh, to a challenging business environment. And, and there's, there's a lot of reasons for it. I think one of the reasons is that architects really don't value the work that they do. I, I think uh, there's uh, a sense that ultimately we won't get the work unless the fees drop mm. to a point where uh, it's not sustainable. Uh, we see, we see that everywhere. I don't think it's, it's uh, something that that's just happening here in our local context, but it, it, I think it's a kind of global thing. Yeah. Um, I think there's an, an aspect to 
the educational background and training where there really isn't, I mean, the emphasis is really on, on the practice of design, not so much, uh, um, running a business. Um, yeah, I think, I think, and, and, uh, I think the profession in a sense, kind of, uh, we're wary of each other. Uh, we don't tend to collaborate. Although I see that, that kind of changing a little bit, uh, certainly in the last, uh, 10 years, the, the kind of collaboration aspect, aspect perhaps could lend itself to, to changing some of that culture. But I, I would say the, the kind of wariness of, of uh, practice to their competitors uh, leads to uh, a lack of sharing of information. So yeah. uh, folks are not, uh, practices are not sharing uh, what kind of fees are, are, are being obtained and, and what kind of salaries and what kind of operating costs are dealing with. Um, so that lends it. So I mean, I think the thinking there is that you, you gain a competitive advantage through that aspect of your business. So why would you share that information? But I, I think ultimately the information sort of seeps out and, and drips and drabs and you sort of see what think what's going on. Um, and I just think it's, it, it goes to a point where things become unsustainable. So many mm. practices are forced to diversification, looking at other, other modes of, of uh, trying to shore up their, their bad habits, which, uh, <laughs> which is a passion of, of in design. <laughs> so for, uh, from, from your experience from yeah. both, both in your own practice and, and seeing what, what Bing was doing, um, where have been the biggest challenges that you've that you've found in kind of maintaining cash flow, maintaining profits on a, on projects? Uh, I mean, it's it's. <laughs> and how have you weathered them? How have you? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, certainly maintaining cash flow is is uh, critical to staying alive <laughs> in business. Uh, one of the key aspects is making sure you're getting paid. I mean, that's, that's sort of uh, job one uh, as a business owner and uh, learning that early, uh, you know, we've had, we're not, we weren't immune to uh, not chasing accounts receivables early in our, in our business. And we just learned the hard way that if, <laughs> If we weren't aggressive on on some of that, we weren't going to be around for very long. So one of the first things we did was we stayed on top of our our receivables, and mm -hmm. uh, you know you start to grow a bit of a thick skin and uh, asking to be paid on time um, in the amounts that that are required to keep a project alive. Uh, you know, are kind of fundamental to. Uh, to keeping keeping going so that that was certainly one aspect of it i think the other piece of it was that uh we felt that if you could add value uh in a in a kind of sufficient uh, amount then sort of winning that arg that payment argument or the fee argument was going to be a little bit easier and uh so we focused on so early on in our in our uh days we we sort of thought about what areas of practice could we add the most value and we sort of tried to try to kind of zero in on those things and we mm. became so so one of those areas was at the front end of schematic design or even pre-design uh certainly in vancouver and in the kind of great greater vancouver area the zoning bylaws were uh, opening up opportunity for rezoning on, on many sites. And we became quite good and, and quite known for successfully navigating through this kind of more complex approvals process that right. involved uh, kind of rezoning. And uh, that through that process, uh, we were able to add a fairly significant amount of value to to a lot of our projects, which uh, opened the door to to uh, getting a reasonable fee and getting hopefully paid on time. Not always, but <laughs> hopefully. 
So that, that, that really helped kind of keep our firm rolling along. And, and we still do a fair amount of that work. And it actually, it's allowed us to, to take on larger scale work. Uh, Cause certainly at the front end, uh, the amount of kind of horsepower that's required, uh, the, the teams are smaller. So we didn't need to be a large practice to, to do the larger scale front end rezoning projects. Yeah. And, and that was uh, also great because we could uh, take on projects of scale, which uh, hopefully the fees are, are a little more manageable. The, um, that kind of um, when you first started out, what, what kind of scale of projects were you working on versus the sort of things that you're doing now? Because you've got quite an incredible portfolio of, of mixed use residential, commercial residential. So, uh, yeah, ironically, uh, unlike most practices that start out doing single family homes, we had because we were doing this overflow work, we called it 911 work 911 not not because of uh September 11th but uh because we were the emergency team that they would call uh yeah. to to kind of come in when there was a crisis so we were a good crisis management team and we were taking on very large scale jobs uh towers 50 story towers 30 story towers large scale mixed use projects uh, taking them on and, and doing design development, schematic design, uh, and even well into to kind of uh, early CD phases. And then, as I said, at 2008, 2009, that, that whole system collapsed. So it wasn't a very sustainable uh, uh, foundation. But then we went back to kind of the traditional mode of practice, but but what it did do because we did manage to get a few of those projects into our portfolio in those early years, I think it was sort of fundamental to having us come out of those recession years and be able to sort of convince clients that we we're able to handle the larger scale projects. We had that experience and we were able to do that. So uh, it, it wasn't long before we started taking on mid scale and, and larger scale, larger scale projects to the point where we are today, where we're doing multiple, uh, make very large scale mixed use projects yeah. with multiple towers and so on. With, with, with that kind of, um, larger mixed use work, how has the business aspects had to evolve if you like to, to be able to, to successfully manage that kind of pro those kinds of projects? Yeah. So, I mean, when I was at Bing's office, we, Bing was dead set against collaborating with other firms. I mean, it was just, whenever we were forced into it, it was a, a kind of re relationship of reluctance and, and uh, kind of always viewed the uh, collaborating firm with a lot of, uh, you know, kind of a leery eye. What are these guys going to do to our work? You know, are they going <laughs> to change it and, destroy our, our beautiful designs. Uh, I, I've, I've kind of changed my mind a little bit over the years uh, since those days. Uh, we do a lot of collaboration um, with, with larger firms and, and I think uh, it's sort of been key to us being able to take on the larger projects is that we will tend to, to sort of run the front end of, of these larger jobs and then yeah um the back end the, the sort of construction documents and and contract construction administration portions of the work are being done by the larger firms and and what it's done is that we've been able to learn uh and and be able to improve our systems uh to the point now where we're uh, kind of doing kind of full service on the mid scale projects so we're able to kind of control those uh, front to back and uh, we're able to, to kind of almost seamlessly collaborate with larger firms because our, our uh, computer systems are set up, our software and so on. We're, we're set up for this kind of seamless collaboration with, with the, the larger practice. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, what makes a successful collaboration between 
yourselves in a, in a practice is there times when <laughs> when it when it doesn't work out and i mean it's as a designer there's always that fear that that uh maybe the design isn't going to work out or or uh you know, the baby, you're going to have to let that baby go and, and see <laughs> if it, if she grows up or not. Uh, you know, you get over it over time, uh, that, that kind of fear dissipates. And I, I think I, I'm a natural collaborator. I, I love working in teams. It's, it's, uh, it, it's sort of for me, at least the, the most enjoyable aspect of the work. And uh, I think once once you get over this uh, this kind of trepidation that <laughs> that you're 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 kind of handing over your design to to another practice, um, I, I think uh, generally all all firms want to do the best work that they can. Uh, you know, everyone's heart is typically in the right place, and and I, I think that's what we've discovered certainly over time is that. Uh, generally everyone's aligned in terms of, of achieving the, the kind of greatest outcome or the best outcome. And, and so once, uh, once we, we, we sort of realize that we're all really on the same page, uh, I think the, the aspect of collaboration is how well can you communicate uh, design intent and, and work together with, with the uh, executing team or the the architect of record to kind of make sure those those kind of elements of design the sort of key elements the dna so to speak uh gets maintained uh through to through to completion uh, th those kinds of um projects how do you typically bid for them in the early stages are you the the point of contact for the client and you win the work and you bring in a large practice or is it the other way around sometimes the large practice brings you guys in for the more for the front end stage of work? Typically we're approached first uh, and then we're not sure really who we'll be teaming up with uh, early on. And, and then it's sort of a, a, a kind of process of discussion with the client, you know, who's the best fit and, and who's capable of doing this work. And it's, it's usually a discussion between the client and ourselves about uh, who might be able to execute the, the, the project. And, and then ultimately, obviously the client makes that decision in the development world, but, but they, we, we're certainly asked and we really appreciate that, that the client uh, does bring us into that discussion, but uh, yeah, normally it's a, a kind of a joint decision between the client and ourselves. How, so how does a business development look like in your, in your office these days then? Uh, so we've, since we got well known for doing a lot of rezoning work, uh, a lot of the work just came to us through word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And over the years, we've really been desperately trying to build up uh, a kind of marketing team, <laughs> if you will. Uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, it's still uh, taking shape and, and we're trying to sort of engage uh, social media, digital media, and those kind of aspects of, of marketing, um, doing competitions and so on. But um, it's not as as, uh, as developed as, as I hope it would be at this stage, mainly because uh, we've just been getting work through just sort of personal connections and, and, uh, and, and sort of having to try to manage the work. The focus has been more on that aspect of practice but we are yeah. i mean hopefully our our uh, digital presence is starting to to grow and and uh, more people are finding out about us great great just going back to the um your your business education that you've had um how has that been helpful in running a practice and, and how have you been yeah, able to re I mean reconcile that you know the 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 <laughs> you know, the business part of, of architecture and the design part, this always, they always appear in many cases to be at head, to be at loggerheads of each other, but. Yeah. I mean, I, I think even with, within me, there's still that internal strug struggle of the, <laughs> the left brain, right brain. Uh, I will always lean to the kind of creative side, but I guess 
by the time I was sort of thinking about leaving, uh, I was a managing director at, at Bing's office. Then I was trying to think about what I would do next. Uh, I was actually thinking about maybe doing something other than architecture. So that was the whole thinking behind getting that MBA. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, a lot of the work I was doing, a lot of the study was in finance and, uh, and, and specifically real estate finance, um, and, and portfolio management. And, and, and I was really thinking maybe it was time to get out of architecture because I could see it was like a long-term and maybe not, not such a sustainable business, mm. but, uh, in the end, I, I just really thought I would be miserable <laughs> doing anything else. And, and so uh, I ended up doing the craziest thing, probably <laughs> uh, from a business perspective. But uh, personally, I'm happy I made that decision. But um, uh, so in terms of running the business, the MBA has been really helpful in the sense that we've been able to help clients understand and and that we do truly uh understand the mathematics behind their projects that that we understand what's needed to make their performance work Mm -hmm. and i think just being able to communicate and and often we've been running performance simultaneously on projects with together with our clients to prove out the, the kind of business case for various aspects of, of our designs. That's been incredibly helpful in allowing us to achieve uh, the kind of design work that we have. I mean, the minute we can kind of demonstrate and get on the same page and financially with a client, we feel that the clients can breathe more easily. They're not going to you know, have this runaway architect uh, going uh, wild with his uh, creations, bankrupting us on this project. So, so uh, being able to, to kind of get to a place where we both speak the same language, mm. uh, ironically, has been able to, to give us this, this freedom uh, to actually be more creative. And, and uh, so that, that kind of business background, that MBA has been sort of fundamental to allowing a allowing us to have that freedom and it's uh been been quite amazing uh, over the years to see how that trust has, has been built and and how we're able to uh uh be able to push the envelope of a lot of our work i mean a lot of people look i mean we have the same budgets everyone else has to yeah. to, to do these projects and and our clients are working with the same banks and the same performance so so a lot of people scratch their heads and go, how are you guys doing this? You know, how are you guys able to sort of pull this off? And a lot of times it's, it's kind of working around the margins, trying to, trying to find places where we can add value efficiency, get, get those margins up so that uh, we can deliver more design for the same amount of money. Mm. And uh, you know, that's in, in turn, that's allowed our clients to, to sort of stand out in the marketplace. Their projects typically sell for a higher price point per square foot. And, uh, you know, over time, uh, we've been able to prove that, that that's pretty consistently true. Uh, so f- we really believe in, in uh, the power of design and the value mm. of design, but, but doing it in a smart way. And I think that that business aspect uh, being able to to be able to speak that language and and be able to work on on that side of the of practice has has allowed that to happen. So that, that's that's really interesting. In being able, you know, this kind of conversation of being able to, you know, be fluent in the language of business and of finance and having an understanding of the mathematics that can kind of underpin projects and what our clients are trying to accomplish. That's often an area where many architects don't feel so confident in and often is, you know, it's, it's, it's an area which means that we don't always have a, a seat at the table, if you like, or designs get put on the back burner because they feel like they're not underpinned by some of the client's fundamentals. 100%, but I don't, you know, personally, I don't think it's, 
been the history of the profession. In fact, when I, right. I have a, a, a sort of book on Frank Lloyd Wright and, and some of the work that he used to do, and you can see a sort of chicken scratch on the side of some of his traces where he was adding up the construction cost of, of the project and, and was sort of doing quantity takeoffs and, and putting budgets together. And you can really literally see that on some of his tracing papers. So it's, you know, I think maybe there's a, a kind of a romanticizing of the, of the practice that sort of happened through maybe the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, where, and, and then the kind of theoretical pursuits kind of came into to the work with yeah. deconstruction. And so on. I, I'm a kind of product of that. Uh, <laughs> when I was going to the GSD, it was, it was highly theoretical. It was, it was only French philosophy and so on. And, and so, you know, I think we strayed quite far from the realities of, of practice, but mm. I think uh, practitioners uh, throughout time uh, and, and, and of, the, of a different time understood that element of the work much, much better than, than maybe that this kind of more recent period. But I think uh, successful architects, successful practices understand that that's a part of what needs to happen. And, and it's an important part of it. I, I think more and more I'm seeing architects actually um, moving into almost full full cycle development where they're doing development design and construction so they're really getting a handle on the on the complete spectrum of uh of business skills required to to, to kind of master that hmm. so i think it's coming back but i i think there really was a period of time where architects felt like you know it was a romantic profession uh we don't want to sort of um you know business is is really kind of peripheral it's it's kind of not really part of the artistic pursuit we we need to be pure and uh and kind of not sully our, ourselves with the with kind of being involved in dealing with money and so on but i i think uh i mean anyone that's survived in architecture understands that that it has to be a, a part of what we do and and kind of turning your back on that it's only going to result in uh, a lot of pain and and heartache and sort of mastering it is is really the key to uh the key to success the key to quality work the key to to actually doing architecture i think yeah. in my mind yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um what from your experience over the last um few years has been some of the most important things to focus on when building a team so building your own your <laughs> well own it's very team. different now uh, you know when i so i'm a gen xer so we we grew up in the in the generation of of uh, scarcity and fear <laughs> and uh, uh you were lucky to have a job literally um so the boss was was king and uh, whatever you were told to do, you did, mm -hmm. uh, you really didn't, didn't speak out. You just sort of, uh, did the work and, and did as you were told. And so that was, that was kind of how I worked my way up through the ranks in, in the early days. I mean, the other aspect of, of my training was that it was really the, the kind of dawn of the computer era yeah and uh autocad was was sort of in its fledgling uh days when i first started and and it was you know a lot of things were changing so so having a bit of youth on my side it was it was uh, a bit of a benefit but uh certainly with the the kind of other generations as they've been coming through we've seen the, the kind of development of the technology to the point where uh, there, there's such a focus on on the digitalization and, and the technology aspect of, of architecture that that some of the more kind of traditional knowledge sets or skill sets were were sort of left um, as sort of secondary things that maybe you could learn over time or, or not learn at all because mm -hmm. you know it was, what was important was doing cool digital uh renderings and cool work so 
what what we're having to deal with is is a kind of generation of trained architects that are uh, incredibly skilled when it comes to visualization but then when it comes to the kind of fundamental aspects of putting buildings together putting projects together we're really uh, sort of uh, having to start almost from from the beginning <laughs> coming yeah. out of school and and uh, so I, I think as a whole the industry or the pr profession now is sort of suffering from from that lack of ability to build the the the, the knowledge of construction is, is sort of disappearing and and What's a little frightening is that that kind of generation before me, these, these are the, the kind of guys, the old gray haired and bald dudes that, that really knew how to put buildings together are all sort of out on the golf course and, and fly fishing now. So, uh, you know, some of these, a lot of firms really relied on these guys to help sort of put the buildings together and train the next generation. Yeah there's not many of them around we're, we're lucky to have one guy in our office who's sort of in and out at, who's who's from that generation and it, it does do a lot of mentoring um but uh, uh that element of, of practice is is uh, a little concerning these days that that uh, the mastery of construction isn't there uh and, and we're having to to really ramp up quite a lot of the younger graduates mm. quite steeply in that aspect of it. Um, and that having said, the, the, the digital tools keep evolving. So, uh, you know, the, the kind of mastery of BIM and, uh, and, and now kind of the, the kind of merging of BIM and three-dimensional modeling tools and, and moving into virtual reality and so on. All, all of those things are moving very quickly uh, and, and moving on to the job site as well. Um, so you have this almost schism, uh, a, a rift in the industry where you have experts in, in digital design, computational design, but then uh, lack of construction knowledge. You have a couple of guys that that still have that knowledge, but we're feverishly trying to transfer that over. So it's a, a really interesting time and also somewhat concerning time in, in the <laughs> profession. Yeah. Well, so this is very interesting. I mean, I've, I've uh, this kind of perspective that in many ways the industry is losing some mm. of its specialist knowledge <coughs> the kind of the art and the art of construction of buildings actually it's such an incredibly valuable <coughs> aspect of of architecture and we and we see this in hiring in many companies at the moment where they are desperately looking for more senior experienced architects and it's it's very difficult and then dealing with students there's often the 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 kind of you know onboarding process or the process or the time it takes to get somebody up and ready for for being an architect is taking longer and longer which is making it harder to harder to employ which then leaves it kind of open for lots of other industries to kind of plug in these gaps if you like yeah. with specialisms yeah i mean i think uh, you really hit the nail on the head with <laughs> with your description i think that's i really see that that's where we're at right now is that we're clutching onto those uh, those experienced senior guys and hoping that they hang on into their 80s and 90s if they you know we're, we're making sure they eat well and work out and uh, you know stay healthy because we, we desperately need their their help and and then uh, it's absolutely true that that getting the younger graduates up up to a point where where they can take over on some of these aspects is taking longer and longer um, because the training in school is mainly focused on kind of mastering the digital aspect of of design and those tools are also becoming more and more sophisticated which is requiring more and more time to master yes. um, so yeah, it's, I'm not sure where we're going to end up. I, I think uh, 
the specialization is, is certainly an element uh, that you're seeing. I, I've always been a big believer in being a generalist in, mm -hmm. in practice because I just feel like the continuity of the work is so important that when you begin to specialize just in one area of practice, uh, you really start to lose the big picture. And ultimately what matters is not how great that digital model is or, or how amazing that rendering is, but the kind of building <laughs> that's the resultant of all of this work and, and kind of, uh, how that's executed and, and, and put together is really the, the kind of ultimate goal. And so by kind of fragmenting out all these specialists, I, I feel that there's always this danger that um, the work, uh, the kind of big picture of the work doesn't get executed properly. So in my practice, I'm still hoping to kind of train up generalists to the best that I can and you know, everyone has their skill set and their interest and, and there's room for a lot of different uh, skill sets in the profession. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm still and, and we're small enough where we can expose our graduates to our students to all aspects of, of the work. But I'm still hoping that as a whole, uh, we don't specialize the profession to the point where it, it, we just become widget makers, you know, this person turns the screw, that person puts the yeah. bolt on, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there's a, there's a product there, but we're not sure how it went together because, uh, you know, it just got passed through so many departments and, and so many, uh, specialists that, that, uh, you know, it kind of is what it is. You know, yeah. I, I, I really feel like if that's, where it's heading, we will have not really uh, uh, done our profession justice. That I still yeah. feel like there's room for architecture, and and architecture is is a vision from the beginning that needs to be executed all the way through. It's not just a a, re a rendering, <laughs> and wow, we're done. You know, the rendering's cool. <laughs> Let's uh, you know everything's great. We're finished. We can go home. You know, no, I mean, it's, uh, it really is, uh, putting that building together front to back. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So what's, what's next for Arno Matisse this year and for the end for 2022? Uh, I think uh, we're in an interesting time right now. Uh, certainly, uh, most cities across North America are in a housing crisis. We have a, a sustainability crisis. I, I think certainly those that are paying attention to the news, uh, we in BC are really suffering from uh, kind of being on the front lines of the, the climate change crisis, especially recently with all the flooding. And, and we've had a lot of fires in the summer as well. So it's a real, a real thing for us here. Yeah. I think uh, what we'd like to be doing is being on the front lines of helping solve some of those problems. I think uh, we're well positioned to, to kind of take on and, and try to come up with solutions. I don't see anyone else really coming up with the solutions. So I think we'll throw our hat in the ring. Uh, how do you build affordable housing? Uh, we have uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of people coming to our country every year and we don't know where they're going to live, you know, mm -hmm. uh, even the people that need housing now can't afford it and they, they don't know where they can live. And, and so coming up with affordable and, and, uh, livable housing solutions is, a, I think it's going to be a key part of our work moving forward. Uh, we want to obviously be, uh, an accountable practice and and be part of the the climate change solution. Um, so we're working on on projects even today uh, that involve uh, you know low carbon uh, accounting and and uh, low carbon building solutions. Uh, all all uh, not using any any fossil fuels in the operations of our, our buildings uh, 
going moving towards passive house envelopes that those kinds of things so so we're we're really uh excited about the possibilities I, I think the opportunities certainly in front of the profession are are incredible i mean this is this is almost a, a kind of new renaissance mm. for for the for the profession and i think as a profession we should be looking at it and taking up a, a kind of leadership role uh taking this opportunity now seizing this moment in time yeah and uh to to really trying to answer these big questions, the kind of daunting issues of, of our age. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Well, I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation there, Arno. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and experience and, and outlook and, uh, and everything that's been happening in your, in your own company. Really, really fascinating stuff. So thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.